Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Ronald Yap. Today we will be talking about nurse navigation in urologic cancer. Cancer is a word that no one wants to hear. Having this diagnosis creates a maelstrom of emotions and fear. New and bewildering medical terminology is used to describe the disease and treatment options. To help patients work through this system and all its complexity and also provide emotional and social support, a new role has evolved in medicine, the role of a nurse navigator. This role has exploded in many areas of medicine. For example, in patients with chronic diseases, such as heart failure, nurse navigators keep patients safe in their homes, compliant with their medication, and act as a critical linchpin in a patient's overall health. So today, Maggie Hammond from the Concord Hospital Center for Urologic Care joins me. She's the oncology nurse navigator, and she's here with Dr. Bill Santos, the director of the Urologic Cancer Program at the Concord Hospital Center for Urologic Care. Welcome, Maggie and Bill. Thank you. Good to have you. Thank you for having us. So first of all, Dr. Santos, let's set the stage for Maggie because you know, you've been here forever, and you've been a fantastic clinical resource, but always in the role of a resource nurse. How did, how did that evolve from being a resource nurse to a nurse navigator? Well, as we developed our cancer program, and try to provide all the services that a patient needs when they're diagnosed with a malignancy and go through treatment, we began to see it's a very complex process. It's really, a, it's quite an adventure for a patient. If you imagine, uh, let's say you have blood in your urine, and then you're sent to the urology office, and you're diagnosed with a tumor, and then you may have more x-rays to get, surgical procedures, consultations with medical oncology, radiation oncology, this, the biopsy may be sent off to another hospital for a second opinion. You may be thinking about clinical trials locally or at a distance. So just to make the diagnosis and to figure out what the appropriate treatment is, it can be overwhelming for a patient. They can have many appointments. Uh, they can have to absorb a lot of information and put it all together. And it, it really can be quite a complex process for a patient. And then on top of that, all the emotional needs for the patient, for the family, financial challenges, emotional challenges, because we don't approach things in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. We're all human beings. So what I saw as a need was to take our patients who are at risk the most for getting lost or not efficiently moving through the process and utilize a navigator to really help streamline that process, to help them get through the diagnosis and treatment quickly and to support them, support them through that process. One example is for invasive bladder cancer, where the time from diagnosis to definitive treatment literally will determine the, the, the survival rates for a patient. So looking at that metric, trying to really consolidate things and, and, and get patients seen quickly, diagnosed, and treated um, was one of my main goals. And then trying to do it with as much support as possible. Mm -hmm. So definitely a big need, and it sounds like initially with the complexity of bladder cancer, but we'll build on that. It's morphed to other, other diagnoses. So it's a big need, and luckily the hospital had the foresight to you know, invest in that. Hence, Maggie, <laughs> you made it. Just to let everybody know, I twisted her arm to come here. Um, she's a great sport. <laughs> and she's, she's been with Concord Hospital for a long time. Oh, yeah. That's in many awesome. different roles. So, so we'll prime up for Maggie, but... So just what Dr. Sanders is talking about, this is a very complex role, and you need the right kind of person. Maggie, you're, you're the right person. You're experienced. You've got great clinical expertise. Okay. So when, when this role became available for, the, for you, this has been something that people have been talking about for a while. It just mm -hmm. didn't pop up out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts when people approached you at the hospital saying, hey, this is what you, know, you could be doing? I think we've always we started really talking about it. It was years ago. We started talking about just because being – a nurse, we're the ones that get the call. And you know, you can identify that there's more to, you know, yes, I just had this diagnosis, but they need a lot more than what we were able to give. So I think we just started kind of brainstorming and then um, the hospital brought in the primary care navigator program. And so we were kind of like, mm, can we kind of jump on board? And it was it was very well received, definitely something that we worked and talked about for a very long time. And I think it was, it was 
pretty straightforward that it was something that was very necessary for the office and for our patients That's because awesome. of their complexity. I think, I think also, uh, I think in the thoracic surgery world, the hospital yeah. had hire, hired a nurse navigator for, for lung uh, and chest malignancies, yeah. and that was a successful venture. So the concept was, was not new. Yeah, and I think they had a sense of it. That's a fantastic differentiation because you talked about primary care, and the, the nursing needs are totally different. And I had mentioned in the intro piece about keeping people at home with heart failure, or chronic diseases. When you talk about surgical things, there's a lot of things that you could be looking at. Mm -hmm. you know, it could be wound issues, a post-op issue, getting them to surgery, your emotion of that, a social support. Um, do you have an example as you got up and running with this about, you know, obviously we'll be HIPAA compliant with names and s situations and everything, but something where you think, hey, you know what? I, you really needed a nurse navigator for it. Really, maybe you could yeah. give an example of good patient. a patient being diagnosed and what kind of patient and kind of what steps you walk them yeah. through. I think some of our most complex are definitely the, the metastatic bladder or even just bladder cancer just because they have so many appointments that they mm -hmm. have to go to. Um, but it's the biggest thing that comes to mind is just the social support. After he, I will go in for the diagnosis and just stay there and sit with them after and just answer questions and offer. I think it's just the fact of having somebody that has the extra time mm -hmm. to sit there and listen. And, you know, as they start to kind of process, they're going to think of more questions that maybe they weren't able to ask the doc or, you know, at least here's my card, call me, mm -hmm. you know, they email me. They, it's just, I think Ron, sometimes we speak to patients yeah. and we know we're saying these 10 things, but when someone hears they have cancer, they may hear nothing beyond that point. They hear that and one to have word. someone who sits there and helps uh, reinforce what was said, let them know they're going to be okay, and then the next day and the day after kind of continue to touch base. Mm -hmm. it's, it's important, the number of touches, to kind of mm -hmm. make sure, are you doing okay? Did you go get that CAT scan? Did you have your medical oncology appointment set up? Kind of continue to touch base with people and see how they're well, doing. Well, and so during the visits, too, you kind of get a sense of, you know, they're going to need a little bit more. So with this, I have the luxury of being able to go with them mm -hmm. to their medical oncology, their radiation oncology appointments, you know, anything that they need. I can even go to the home with a visiting nurse, Yeah. you know, for any added support, that, which is that's amazing. That's huge. And the triage nurses are wonderful. Nursing staff is wonderful. Mm -hmm. they're, they're on the phone, and they have some office appointments where you can see them. But we were just joking before the show. You're like the special forces of nursing. I mean, wherever you need to go, you're like in there, man. Mm -hmm. You know, you crawl into a cave with them. I'm able to still to, stay huh? hands-on, which is great. Yeah, yeah. I can still and, do the procedures. And, and yeah. I know recently, just to allude to a non-specific patient, but we had a patient uh, that we used your services for that needed a palliative care appointment and guidance through that whole experience of what does that mean. And you even went to the appointment with them. Mm -hmm. You answered questions. You were on the phone and available. And it's not just, it's emotional support, but from what I'm seeing from what you've been doing, it's, it's also the clinical stuff. You can't, anybody can, you know, it's all important, but you do more because you have the clinical knowledge. So you know when to be medical, you know when to be social and supportive, and you have to have that mix of you know, all of it. I'm lucky I get to combine it all. Yeah, and yeah, and, and, all. and I tell you what, we've <laughs> had a couple of these like problem patients where there can be an active surgical matter and you can switch, well, you know, oh boy, the wound doesn't look good, that mm -hmm. doesn't sound right, let's bring you in. Um, and that's, that's huge. Uh, so aside from the activities where you visit and have other surgical type stuff, and any other roles that you think a nurse navigator you know, supports the cancer program um, in your mind? One of the new things that we've brought I think just into the office, I've worked in conjunction with the wound care center um, and general surgery in developing an ostomy support group. Mm -hmm. So it's not just for urostomy for our patients, it's for, for everybody, which is Why don't you guys huge. explain what an ostomy is? Yeah. The audience may not know that. Really unfortunately, there are people that have um, colon cancer, bladder cancer, and this really ties into your role in bladder, because we started off as, as bladder cancer, um, is uh, a, a channel by which the, the fecal stream or the urine stream goes to when it needs to be bypassed. And these patients, it, there's a lot to this, actually. Mm -hmm. it's they, I think that there are a lot of people that just need to have them, and they're unfortunately stuck with them, and that's a huge emotional burden. But unfortunately, all of them have a problem. I think essentially 100% of the time, there's always something that you have to get some guidance about. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a pretty, these are people that are kind of in, in the shadows of medicine. 
in the sense that no one really talks much about it, mm -hmm. and there's not much support for these people. And so, so spe specifically, a piece of intestine comes to the surface of the abdomen, and then in our situation, when we can't make a new bladder and we divert the urine in this way, the urine then runs continuously into a bag uh, that's stuck to the skin around this piece of intestine, and the urine is collected there, and then there's a valve, and the patient just drains the, the valve. This bag stays there for five to seven days and then gets changed. If someone's having trouble with that bag staying in place, they can leak urine and their quality of life is really adversely affected. If the skin gets irritated, things like that. Helping us mark the patient, deciding where to put this. Maggie's involved with that, looking at the wrinkles in the skin, how the patient wears their pants and such, mm -hmm. and then looking at the skin and figuring out what appliances will work best to stay in place is really an art that's only developed after years and years of inpatient work, outpatient work. So it's, uh, it's an important skill that ostomy nurses have, and Maggie um, is able to do that as well. That's great. And this is brand new stuff. I mean, that's something yeah. that you're just, you know, this is just rolling out right now. We've also, I think just in my role, I've been able to really kind of hone in more on what types of patient education that we need to add to our to our group to, you know, things to kind of, you know, we, you hear that people get given this, the infamous book for patients with prostate cancer, and it just kind of lays out every single type of treatment that you can have. And we think, oh, it's great, you know, read this, this chapter one, chapter two, but you get home and you read everything and you get more ideas than they get online. And I think that's when I'm able to give mm -hmm. them a call and say, do you have any questions about, you know, what you just met the doctor about? And it's just, it's able, you're able to kind of tease out more of their concerns and guide them more to what their needs are. And that's a wonderful segue because we were talking initially about bladder cancer. Uh, as, as bladder cancer was the initial inception of the nurse navigator, it's, it's expanded to other issues. All, I think all urologic, all urologic malignancies. So yep. kidney cancer, prostate cancer, testicular. bladder cancer, testicular cancer. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that- Men and women. Mm -hmm. And being the men's health program, we'll focus, you know, let's hone in a little bit on the prostate stuff because I know you're very, very active for uh, before, during, after radical prostatectomy, uh, which can be a life-changing surgery for a lot of men. Mm -hmm. um, as we just walk through somebody with bladder cancer, can you walk through, you mentioned a couple of questions. How about someone that has, uh, is going through the surgery? What type of support do you do pre, intra, post-op for that patient? So obviously starts with the diagnosis. Um, and then, you know, they're presented with options of what types of treatment would be appropriate for them. Can you talk about tumor board a little bit? Yep. Um, the docs will all gather. We meet twice a month, and we meet. It's a, it's a very dynamic group. We have all of the urology providers. We meet with um, radiation oncology, medical oncology, um, interventional radiology will join us. We have social worker. We have palliative care, hospice. Everybody's kind of just a meeting of the minds. We'll present a patient. Um, it's generally more of the complex cases that the docs are really just kind of looking, you know, what do you think about this, sir? And it's just, we let the patients know we're gonna present your case to the tumor board. And also, it kind of gives them an added sense of kind of relief and, oh, there's more eyes looking in on this. They mm -hmm. don't have to go for another appointment. You know, and then we'll say, you know, I'll touch base with you after the, after the meeting and we'll, you know, so you can hear what these other doctors have to say. Mm -hmm. and it, oftentimes will help them make a decision on what course to choose for treatment. And you're, you're, you're active, you're there, you know, you're at the table. Yep. And we're all making decisions. So the decisions made to have surgery, how about uh, education, uh, you know, physical exercises, you know, Kegel type stuff, you know, during, after a prostate. I think we've time. worked really hard just for the nursing education. We've got. We have a, we have a standard pathway of, yeah. of patients getting educated prior to surgery as to what the experience is going to be like, what are the activities to, to do to prepare, and then streamline to physical therapy afterwards uh, and uh, following group. people to see what they're doing. We have the man-to-man -man support group, which one of our other nurses, Lynn, leads mm -hmm. with. It's the largest cancer worker. support group in the state. They're amazing. And it's the prostate cancer uh, community oh, yeah, in we this area. That. And what's amazing about that's one of the biggest groups in the state. And patients come that haven't even had care from our institution. Right, sure. They'll come, they come up because around. they don't have support at their place, yep. and they come here and talk. And what's cool about it is that you know you're you're aware of it, and involved tumor board there too. And if I think a lot of times patients, they just want someone that they want a name. 
they want somebody. And I yeah, know you've got, point. yeah, the awesome thing about it is that, you know, you've got a card. And another example, just as we're kind of rolling with the different things we're involved with, uh, the new biomarkers for prostate cancer. And just thinking off the top of my head, you were instrumental in rolling that out before case four to try to risk stratify people with a high PSA, which is a screening test for prostate cancer. I know you were a contact point because people were interested and I'd grab your card and I'm like, here, here's Maggie. Uh, she'll tell you what to do. Just here, here she is. Um, and tell me more about that, rolling that test out. <laughs> it's challenging. Yeah, why is that? <laughs> I think it's more because it's always something new and you know, then you were, we're dealing with a laboratory that's outside of our hospital. You're de dealing with billing and insurance issues, which was huge with mm. that. Um, you know, the patients do their research when they are told they have this specific thing. They will go out and read everything and they come in very prepared and they want answers and they want to know, you know, can I have this, 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 why can't I? And, you know, we have to be ready and be able to answer those. And it was easier to have a person that's able to, you know, be in touch with that rep for the lab. And, mm -hmm. but it, 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 can, it got a little tedious. You know, in Little Concord, <laughs> New Hampshire, we've always wanted yeah. to be on the front edge of the curve and whether it be different ways to more accurately diagnose disease or treat disease, we really are, are practicing in the most modern oh, way yeah. possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We, we're in the process of purchasing an MRI fusion device that allows us to diagnose prostate cancers more effectively. And uh, I think that patients in this community are really fortunate that this hospital uh, invests in new technology and continues to recruit uh, good people, I think, uh, really were, were able to provide excellent care. That's really awesome. You're lucky. So what do you think the, the role going? Going it, forward? Yeah, yeah. I think it's only just going to get bigger and better. There's so much that we can do. You know, we're bringing in, like you said, you know, new new tests, new procedures. It, it's just something to latch on to and help continue to educate our patients and support them. Yeah, well, I'm glad you decided to take the role because, like I said, not everybody can do it. You have to have a lot of clinical experience, I think. I don't think this is a role for a new grad, someone that has yeah. good, you know, lays hands on patients. And you have to have, feel, you have to feel out these patients, too. I'm some, very every, lucky, though. I have a yeah, support. Team yeah, everybody huge. needs different things, you Mag know? Maggie, what were you doing before you were a nurse navigator? What was I doing? Yeah, what job? I was a resource nurse in yeah. the office. So an outpatient resource nurse. Yeah. And before that, what were you doing? You're in the hospital. I've been, I've been in the hospital. Yeah, I was at. I've been at urology for 15 years at the hospital for. I don't know. So that. <laughs> so post-op patients on the floor prior yeah. to that. Med surge. What was your first job at Concord Hospital? My I love this. I love this. Like 20 oh. questions with Dr. Yeah. Sanis. This is a spinoff. As a teenager. <laughs> yeah, this is like Joni loves Chachi. I think. You know, we're going happy days well, to Joni loves Chachi. What was Chachi. your first job? I was 17 and worked in the cafeteria. There you have it. That's awesome. So you're a Seven. total Concord Hospital lifer, Roots man. Roots up. Yep. The cool thing about the place, too, is, I mean, well, you know, it's all like drinking out with the Kool-Aid, but ch your story is not alone. I mean, there are tons of people at the hospital that I've met. They stay forever. That they started off with something, and they do something that, like, use tuition reimbursement to start an entry job. And yes. There are all kinds of radiology techs, nurses, everybody, mm -hmm. and it's really cool that they've stayed in the community, and the hospital's invested in these people. And mm -hmm. some leave and come back because they leave, and they think, the job stinks here, and they go somewhere else, and they realize that it's so much worse other places. Yeah, it's always green. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So cool. I think that's a, an important point, and and I've seen people who have trained to do different roles in the community, or people who no longer could do one particular job, and and they're retrained to do a different job. So I think it's important to use what you have. You're that's usually awesome. better making where you are what you want it to be than running around looking for something else. You're right, else. you're darn right. And we talk about this a lot in our practice meetings. That's like the vision. So you saw the need, uh, no matter what, fusion, biopsy, lasers, you name it. Robotics. And it's full service. So we're not a country bumpkin hospital, guys. You know, world class, world class staff, world class um, technology. And it's, I'm just really glad that you're doing this because it's given, I actually think it's given you a new lease in your career in the sense that nursing is great, but you know, it, it can be, you know, not tedious per se, but you like to challenge yourself and do I something, do something I love new. My job. Yeah, and this is definitely challenging. You know, mm -hmm. so one other thing, right, Bill? So we were talking yeah. about um, you doing this job, and one thing when I first asked you and twisted your arm to come, and you, you're awesome for coming, is that you said, "Oh, Doctor, yeah, what is that? May? What is it? May third? <laughs> you're like, you're like." That's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we would be remiss if we didn't uh, celebrate it. And actually, Dr. Sandis was totally awesome. 
and he got a cake. Well, that was actually Lynn. Yeah. Oh, Lynn. Uh, okay, first it. Lynn, who, yeah. who runs do the man-to-man group. Do we have to sing? We don't group. have to sing, do we? My little oh, yeah, we definitely do. Partner and in crime. And Melissa's oh, cool because you're not allowed to bring food here, I don't think, either. Or flame. Don't, don't tell Doris. <laughs> Yeah, or fire too. Oh my gosh, we got pyrotechnics. This is like crazy. So happy we, birthday! Thank you. Yeah, she's one year old, and then there's one for good luck. Yeah. Do you want right. to tell everyone your age? No. Okay. You can guess. Why don't you clap it out? My grandfather used to taught us to clap it out so you're not blowing on the cake. So why don't you clap it out? But then it's get closer. Get I'm gonna have to cut this blooper reel. Oh yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Maggie. Probably see you. Happy birthday. Thanks for coming, Dr. Hey. Santos. Thank Thanks you very much. Yeah. Thank